Hey everybody, this is Zachary Jeans. Let's keep walking through the Bible. So today is day 360, and we are walking our way through the Old Testament right now. We're in the book of Exodus, and we're going to be picking up with kind of the last of the section talking about how, how to set things up. Um, where Moses is up on the mountain receiving uh, the commandments, the procedures for consecration, the setting up of things at the temple, who to uh, put in charge of those things, uh, lots lots of that. And, and he's receiving the infamous 10 tablet or the two tablets, right? With all the stuff written by the finger of God. So that's where we're at, and uh, we're going to get right into it. Um, we're picking up in chapter 29, but before we do so, let's pray. Lord, I love you. God, thanks for this day. Thanks for your word. Lord, we just lay this day before you. <laughs> I lay my life before you. God, there's so much going on. Always is, but just so much, Lord. And we're weak. And uh, our bodies have some strength, but not all the strength we wish they had. Well, we just give them to you. We give you our lives and we love you, Jesus. Thank you for being our sacrifice. Thank you for being our high priest. Lord, thank you for being the one who, uh, who bridges the gap in, between us and you, Lord. Thank you for being God on earth. Thank you for promising to come again. Lord, we love you. I love you. And it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right. Hmm. Okay, so if you want to, please feel free to open up your Bible. Got my ESV here. And uh, we're opening up to chapter 29. And we're going to look at the consecration of the priest to start here. Um, we're going to read chunks of this. Again, we're, we're moving through fairly detailed procedural stuff. And and uh, being a read-through, please read through it. Um, but I'm going to touch on some points within these chapters. We aren't going to read verse by verse. So, uh, chapter 29. So, we've just talked about the making of the uniforms, the, the priestly garb. And here is the consecration of the priests. So, chapter 29, verse 1 says... Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. So they need to be set apart. They need to be consecrated. And this is the procedure. This is the anointing them with the, um, the sacrificial blood and sacrificing animals on behalf of their garments. They're to take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. So unleavened bread, no leaven. A little bit of leaven corrupts the whole loaf, right? And um, and Jesus will use that, that concept uh, much later. So all these things Jesus used to teach the principles of uh, corrupting uh, stuff and stuff that's set apart, but Jesus came to fulfill the law. So he's not saying that we all have to go around eating unleavened bread. And he's not saying that we have to go splashing blood, the uh, blood of bulls and, and goats on stuff. Um, his sacrifice was more than sufficient to fulfill all of these necessary requirements of law. But let's look at the meaning behind this. So that the bull and the two rams, unleavened bread, and it says in verse 5 that you're going to take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the aphod, you know, the robe with the, the various rows of, of, of minerals and or, or jewels. And you shall take the anointing oil, verse 7, pour it on his head. And it's just going to drip down. This purified oil, he's going to be set apart. In verse 10, you shall bring the bowl before the tent of meeting. So this is that bowl that... that uh, uh, Moses opened up with, right? He's going to bring it before this tent of meeting, right? And Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. So can you visualize that? You got the crowds of people standing around at a distance. And Moses 
has anointed Aaron and his sons who are going to perform the priestly sacrifice and, and the atonements and the various rituals that are going to be done, done on behalf of the people of Israel to um, not only mitigate <laughs> their sinful nature and between their sinful nature and God, but mediate, build relationship. And uh, they're going to do so, but they themselves have to be consecrated and the tent of meeting has to be set apart and all this. And that's so they bring this bull, they lay hands on its head. And you shall kill the bull before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And you shall take part of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger. And the rest of the blood you shall pour out at the base of the altar. So you aren't drenching this thing in blood, but you are going to anoint it, uh, the horns of this altar, and then the blood will be put at its base. And then you're going to take the fat and liver and burn it, and the rest of the stuff you're going to burn it outside of the camp, and it's a sin offering. And then they're going to take the ram and do a similar process. But what I want you to do is to come down to the end of the chapter, To verse 42. So it's talking about the regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak with you there. There I will meet with you, the people of Israel, and it shall be sanctified by my glory. Verse 44. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar, Aaron also, and his sons, I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel, and I will be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Whole point purpose, that God's presence would travel and be in their midst, and that he would meet with them by means of the tent of meeting. That God would be with them, that this living God who brought them out of Egypt, that performed all of these miracles through Moses and Aaron, that uh, literally threw down Pharaoh in the Red Sea and then conquered a couple enemies here and there uh, on their way to the land of Israel and then into the land of Israel. This God was going to dwell among them. He's not some distant God. He's not some frog God of the river in Egypt. He's not... Uh, the, the sun god, Ra, he, he is the living creator God, and he is living in and amongst the people, and he's going to meet with them in this holy tent. And it's been set apart through ritual. Uh, they've been set apart, the priests, they've been consecrated to the Lord. This is how God is going to dwell and honor his commitment to them. Okay, verse 30. Let's talk about the altar of incense briefly. Okay, we're going to read the whole chapter. Verse 30, or chapter 30, verse 1. You shall make an altar on which to burn incense. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length, and a cubit its breadth. So 18 inches by 18 inches, roughly. Its horn shall be one piece with it. You shall overlay it with pure gold, its top and around its side, and its horns. So this, this altar, 18 inches, it's got horns, and it's overlaid with gold, this acacia wood. And gold is pretty amazing. Um, I was recently watching something uh, where they were talking about how amazing gold is and how uh, how it doesn't corrupt, um, you know, once essentially the impurities have been pulled out of it and uh, how it can be overlaid, gold plate, over things and uh, just how pure it is and how how little you need to actually melt and then cover things. It's a very small amount of gold that's needed to actually cover things. Um, it's pretty amazing. So probably worth a good YouTube video on. It's really interesting. So let's come back down though. Verse, uh, uh, let's come down to verse nine. You shall not offer unauthorized incense on it, or burnt offering or grain offering, and you shall not pour a drink offering on it. Now, this will come up, unauthorized incense. So there's very specific incense, uh, which we'll get to in uh, the uh, verse 22. 
but unauthorized incense will be <laughs> burned here and there will be God's penalty on those people. They will die. And and it's interesting because we live in a a period of time now where Jesus has fulfilled the law and we don't burn the incense on the altar and we are not a part of the Israel Israel people, people of Israel who came out of Egypt were grafted in as Gentiles and and um, Jesus has filled all these laws, right? But at this time, this was dead serious. That God was not in any way allowing for people to make light of his word, of his ritual, uh, his worship. And even putting unauthorized incense and burning it there was seen as a death penalty. So <clears throat> let's drop down to the bronze basin. No, well, we'll start, take that back. Let's go to the census tax real quick, just real quick. When the Lord, this is verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, when you take a census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give this, a half shekel, According to the she shekel of the sanctuary, the shekel is 20 geras, half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. The rich shall not give more, the poor shall not give less. Then the half shekel, when you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives, you shall take the atonement for money for the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting. And it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord, so as to make atonement for your lives. There was a census taken, and every man 20 years and older. So this is uh, interesting to me for a couple points. So culturally speaking, um, the coming of age in various cultures including the Jewish people, is uh, is different. So this, at least in my understanding, Ba Mitzvah, the coming of age for a young man, is much younger. 13, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's 13 uh, years of age. And uh, women... Uh, once they start menstruating, are thought to be mature, right? Now, in our culture here in America, um, we're pretty clear that no, <laughs> you aren't an adult yet, um, not legally anyway. Um, excuse me, got to sneeze. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, thanks for those who just said bless you. <laughs> I'll receive it. So the coming of age in America, um, at least legally, is 18. And 21, in other cases, in terms of the drinking of alcohol um, and other things, gambling, uh, taking part in other adult activities. So, but at 18, in the United States, you're considered an adult uh, legally. Um, you can achieve adulthood earlier through emancipation from your parents and application uh, for your independence. Uh, and that varies state to state. Um, each state has its own laws about how young you can be married. Um, I believe they just fixed a law in Washington state uh, that you can marry as early as 13. Um, a lot of this all was done back in the pioneering days when people were coming across and, uh, you know, families were scarce and people were getting married and living shorter lives because it was a hard life. So every culture throughout time in history has had different ages of coming to age. I want to point out that the Bible does delineate here. The coming of age in terms of being a fighting man is 20 years old. 
And what we know about brain health and, and maturing of, of men, um, I think this kind of fits in with that. They think that um, our brains don't fully form as men until we're 25. Like they're still uh, reprocessing and growing and changing and altering and our chemistry is being settled. And, um, and I wonder, I wonder if, uh, there was a quicker process back then, but all that said, if you're still trying to figure out life and you're not quite yet 20, guess what? You weren't even offering a, a temple tax on behalf of yourself until you became 20. Now you might've participated in a whole lot of activities in Israel, uh, at a younger age for sure, than we do in our current culture um, at this time frame in the 21st century. But 20 years old, it's a much later age than I think people perceive when they read back in their Bible and they wonder, oh, well, they did X, Y, and Z um, at such a young age, these adult activities. Um, but again, here we have the age of 20. So let's look at the bronze basin. Um, the Lord said to Moses, you shall make a bronze basin with its stand of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. And so in this bronze, there's a cleansing process and, um, it's to be kept clean and it's for ceremonial washing. Let's look at the oil and the incense. Verse 22. We just talked about unauthorized incense. Let's look at the authorized incense. Lord said to Moses, take fine spices. Okay, we've got liquid myrrh, 500 shekels. Sweet swel swelling, sweet smelling cinnamon, half as much. That's 250 shekels. And 250 shekels of aromatic cane. 500 shekels of acacia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hen of olive oil. And so has a perfumer come and make this special incense. And then everything <clears throat> is to be anointed with the oil. And with verse 34, the Lord said to Moses, take sweet spices, stacte, onksha, galbanum, sweet spices with pure frankincense of each. There shall be an equal part and make an incense blended as by the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. And you shall beat some of it very, very small. I said very, very. It only says one very. Very small. And put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting, where I shall meet with you. It shall be most holy for you. And the incense that you shall make, according to its composition, you shall not make for yourselves. It shall be holy for the Lord. Whoever makes any like it to use this perfume shall be cut off from his people. Now, here we are post fulfillment of the law and many of the things that are described in here, we don't do. And many of the things that are described in the law uh, that say not to do, we do. And so I wonder if people um, are inclined to go make this special incense to smell it for themselves and not to use it in a ceremonial position as it's, as it's stated here. Um, I think it would be interesting just to smell it. I don't think that you're going to be cut off for making it. Now, if you do so and you flaunt any of these things in front of God, any of these Old Testament laws, and you do so in, in a, um, you know, basically, you know, curse the Lord out sort of way, like your, your whole point is to mock God, um, I don't know that the thing itself will get you in trouble with God. It's the mocking of God through something which God had written down. Um, and, and because you're making a fine point on it by taking something written down here of what to do or not to do and then shoving it up in God's holy face, uh, it's the shoving it up in God's holy face that he's going to take most uh, most serious. And 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 you will you will receive in the penalty um, in your life, a whole host of, of judgments. 
And, and it's interesting. People are like, well, there are people that mock God all the time. They do satanic symbolism. They sacrifice. They do horrible crimes on earth. And I'm like, yeah, they do. And they will receive their judgment. They will receive their judgment. And they receive all kinds of judgments that they don't publicize in their personal lives. Okay. So um, just because you don't see anybody who's mocking God publicly uh, receiving judgments in a way that you can discern doesn't mean that they aren't experiencing them in their personal life. Uh, as God pokes at them and causes them to realize he's real and, hey, you ought to knock that off and come to me. And uh, they continue to rebel and rebel and rebel. And uh, and they do so in appealing to Satan even. And guess what? At the end of their life, they'll get everything they wanted in that. They'll get Satan. And they'll get where he dwells or will be cast down to. So they will receive ultimate judgment. So if you go out and make this perfume, do I think you'll go to hell? No, I don't think you'll go to hell. But if you go and make this perfume or this incense, um, and you do it in such a way to mock God or to wear it around and say, like, I'm sanctified and holy, and uh, you might get something. I mean, just letting you know, you might get some in this life that'll let you know that you probably shouldn't do it. So this is that weird interplay between the law being fulfilled and, and, uh, and us not being subject to it. Paul said, you know, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. And there's this weird figuring out of that. Some things are obvious, uh, you know, don't commit adultery. It's a law. Um, but guess what? Uh, if you do, <laughs> there will be consequences. It's kind of obvious. But if you make some perfume, you know, after the pattern here or some incense after the pattern here, uh, nobody knows that you made it that way. And uh, you did it just to uh, get a, a sense of what it smelled like. Then I don't know that God's going to punish you. Um, but if you go around wearing it, thinking that, you know, in your pride of your heart, you know, I'm wearing the holy incense that was described in Exodus. And, you know, you feel special. God might make you feel real special. Just to make a point. That he's God and you aren't. All right. So let's look at, at verse uh, 1 of chapter 31. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by the name Bezalel, the son of Uri, and son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. So we got grandson of her and I have filled him with the spirit of God with the ability and intelligence with knowledge and all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs to work in gold silver and bronze and cutting stones for setting and in carving wood to work in every craft and I have, and behold I have appointed with him Aholiab the son of Ashamach of the tribe of Dan and I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. God gives us gifts. And he gives artisans and craftsmen gifts. And I know I've belabored this before, but I'll just say it again. If you have a gift for being a craftsman. If you have a gift for being an artist. If you have a gift for carving stuff and and building buildings, and weaving, and, and all this stuff. God gave you those gifts. Use them. Use them for the Lord. And everything you do, if you're just building a house for somebody, do it to God's glory in your heart. Every time you make a cut, every time you measure, every time you fix something, do it for God's glory. Know that your labor is a gift from the Lord. Your gifts that give you the ability to see how things ought to be sorted out and made and, and organized to make beautiful things. Guess what? The Lord said they're beautiful things. Some things are not beautiful. Some things are. Not everything is beautiful. I know that in our equality state that we love to live in, where everybody can make uh, anything. Um, yes, everybody has the merit of creating. 
And that in and of itself is a beautiful thing. But some people have been given a gift. And uh, don't beat up on people for making beautiful things. Don't beat them up. Because guess what? God gave them those gifts. All right, let's look at the Sabbath. Verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. Day of rest, right? For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. What's the purpose of the Sabbath? That throughout all generations, listen, Throughout all your generations that you may know what? That I, the Lord, sanctify you. The Sabbath is a sign that God set his people apart. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Absolutely holy. It's set apart. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. And like, if somebody skips the Sabbath, should we kill them? No, again, this is for the people of Israel coming out of Egypt, establishing uh, themselves in the promised land. But all that you'll see over the course of the whole Old Testament, they violate. In fact, they're going to violate. <laughs> Moses hadn't even finished coming down off the mountain yet. And they had already rebelled against God. But the Sabbath is a holy thing. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does work, any work on it, that shoal shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. Solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. So this covenant was never meant to end. It's a covenant between the Lord and his people. Their part is to honor it. God is the one who set it apart. It's a life and death issue. It's meant to be holy. For the people, a day of rest. They aren't to worship in the work, but worship the Lord in a day of rest. Um, That's not what I mean. Of course, honor the Lord in your work. The day of rest is meant to be there for us to honor the Lord. Now, do we keep the Sabbath today? Paul said all days, one day and every day is alike now. You can honor and worship the Lord every day. The Lord Jesus who fulfilled the law. He said that in his coming and even in that transition point, when they tried to catch him breaking the Sabbath by healing somebody, right? And pointing out that God made provision for them and didn't kill them when they like helped an animal that had fallen into a well and was going to die on the Sabbath, that it was okay to go ahead in that case to save them. Um, when they're walking through the grain fields from point A to point B and they grabbed a little piece of grain and rubbed it between their fingers and, you know, chewed on it. And they're like, ha ha, see, you know, you're breaking the Sabbath, your disciples, Jesus. And he's like, man, you don't get it. The Sabbath was made for you. Okay. So you'd have rest. God didn't want you to be workaholics and dishonor God and not take any time to sit back and honor the Lord. Like they missed the point of the Sabbath. But to be fair, it was a dead serious thing. And, um, but over the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years between the giving of this command and Jesus day, let alone us, um, these covenants, these, these organizations of, of ritual would be profaned, over and over and over and over and over again. And they'd be disregarded and in fact mocked. And God wouldn't kill everybody right away. He would reach out to them patiently through prophets and judges, trying to get them to come back to him. 
And all of this showed that even a people set apart couldn't keep God's righteous ways, even a small set of commandments, really. Because there's always continually in us this rebellious nature, this constant rebellion that we have against the Lord, always kicking against God. Why don't you come on down, and we'll close this with this, and I think this is just a powerful thing. Verse 17, It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. God has all power, all creativity, all ability, and yet God rested. He took pause in his glorious state after creating all things, and likewise, he gives that to us. So that principle of Sabbath is there for us, even now in the fulfillment of the law. And he gave to Moses, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. The tablets of stone were written by the finger of God. God himself wrote into these tablets, these stone tablets, with his own finger, these divine expressions. Isn't that amazing? He didn't get out like a, some sort of stone carving chisel. He didn't get out like a Dremel. <laughs> you know, he got, he got his own finger, God's finger. Can you imagine Moses watching God write into actual stone, just like moving it around like with butter with his own hand? And we're going to see what happens to those tablets because you got to remember, he's gone up onto this mountain. Thunder and rolling, cracking lightning and appearance of fire and cloud and he's up there 40 days and 40 nights. Joshua is standing at some distance. Yeah, what a powerful scene. Two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. And they're going to be crushed. Because the people rebelled. They rebelled before he even got down off that mountain. Amazing. All right. Well, hey, till tomorrow, day 361. God bless you. Keep walking. Bye-bye.